One of my favorite Bible stories is Judith cutting off the head of the man waging war against her homeland. It also happens to be the subject most ruminated on by my favorite Baroque artist, Artemisia Gentileschi. So a little backstory. This scene is taken from the apocryphal book of Judith in the Old Testament of the Bible. Nebuchadnezzar waged war against Israel with some guy named Holofernes as his war general. As Holofernes and his troops were closing in on the city of Bethulia, the beautiful widow Judith got mad at her fellow countrymen for not believing that God could deliver them from their colonizers. But Judith understood the power of manifestation, prayer, and basically how men think. So she resolved to go into Holofernes' camp with her loyal maid Abra under the guise of giving the general information on Israel. She said that he won and she would basically give herself up to him. On the fourth day of being in his camp, Judith was able to get him drunk and with the help of Abra, was able to slay the inebriated Holofernes, taking her prize back to her town. Her people found courage upon seeing the head of their enemy and was able to defeat Holofernes' soldiers. And Artemisia has painted this episode multiple times. Born in 1593 in Rome to Prudenzio di Ottaviano and painter Orazio Gentileschi, Artemisia showed artistic prowess at a young age. Her father who trained her even proudly claimed that she was more talented than her brothers. Her art style was inspired by her father who himself was inspired by Caravaggio. So from 1612 to 1620, she moved to Florence, Italy where she found success as a court painter and befriended the likes of Galileo Galilei and Caravaggio. The latter painting his own version of Judith slaying Holofernes which anteceded Artemisia's. Many have followed suit but there is something so intriguing and alluring about Artemisia's version. See, unlike all of these other versions that paint the female characters as either passive figures with somewhat indifferent or disgusted facial expressions like they're merely accessories in the crime or passers-by in the scene, or they're just way too perfect and the scene lacks gore and brutality. Artemisia, on the other hand, poured out all of her female rage on canvas. Her anger at female repression and subjugation as well as the trauma of being raped and then going through torture to verify her claim during trial. And Judith in her version is seen struggling, even with her maidservant's help. See, they aren't turned towards the audience but are engrossed in the act. They aren't portrayed as having superhuman strength, although there are women with insane physical strength. But for the most part, a lot of women couldn't physically overpower a man. Our strength is in numbers, in our allyship, our minds. Both women are no longer accessories, but are active and determined in the killing of their enemy. And there's something about women who are scared but choose to be brave. Abra helping her despite the risk of going into a war criminal's tent reminds me of the women who choose to protect another woman who is a complete stranger from being harassed at a bar or along the streets, even if that means that they could also become targets. That's why women go to the bathroom together, why we look after each other even. It also shows how tactical and brave Judith is to use a man's desire for power and pussy. She bit her time and waited until Holofernes passed out instead of using brute force the minute she got into his camp. And again, the struggle is very important because women throughout history did not have an easy time despite what some might say. Oh, women can get free drinks at bars, they say, completely disregarding the risk like women being coerced into doing things they are uncomfortable with by the man that gave that free drink or getting drugged. Women and young girls getting beaten up or even killed simply because they said no, because they rejected a boy. And don't even get me started on the whole housewife discourse, as if women in history didn't work in fields or factories or work as maids and midwives. And housewives have their own struggles to deal with. That's why this piece is so cathartic and I will forever reference this when talking about female rage, repression, and representation.
One of the biggest disappointments this year was probably Sam and Abel's little corn fantasy that is The Idol. I was actually looking forward to watching the show what with all the hype surrounding it, only to be hit with the not at all surprising realization that Sam Levinson just does not have one original thought in that Freudian perverted brain of his, and that the idol should probably stick to making songs. I actually enjoy his music and he's inspired many video essays on the ingenuity of his music. And I could talk more about how boring and embarrassing the show is, but I digress. Since the internet is already saturated with so many think pieces and commentaries on it, Instead, I will focus on the one thing that truly struck me. And that is, some men just aren't as imaginative as they imagine themselves to be. Especially when it comes to women. Jocelyn, the main character, is a former child actress turned sultry pop superstar a la Britney Spears or Selena Gomez. She apparently grew up forced to work as an actress by her controlling mother and was much beloved as a child as, you know, suggested by this line. So nice to meet you. So, so lovely to meet you. I actually grew up watching you on Rock House. Oh. She then transitioned to a music career and began to sexualize herself to shed her innocent image, which is a pattern we see from real-life child actresses, but weirdly enough, not from the child actors. But that's a topic for another day. Jocelyn's mom passed away a year before the events of the show which led to her debilitating mental health and anyone who watched the show could tell that she is the victim of abuse, be it from her mother, the entertainment industry, or Abel's character. And yet, the ending of the show tells us that she is apparently the evil mastermind behind everything that happened. She was the one controlling the rat-tailed club owner and charismatic cult leader wannabe, when in fact, it was the other way around. And we don't even get a Rashomon effect or a flashback type scene that shows us that she was the one pulling the strings all along. The show is just hours of gratuitous nudity and BDSM scenes, Jocelyn chain-smoking and awkward dialogue carried by conjecture from its defenders. The main thesis of the show is that women are evil and the man is the victim and honestly, how typical. It's like a Darman video, it's like that line from Charles Bukowski's novel Women. It goes, The male for all his bravado and exploration is the loyal one who generally feels love. The female is skilled at betrayal and torture and damnation. There is this narrative that women are cunning and we use our power to get what we want, but that we also have no power and are just absolute weaklings because we are just females, etc, etc. You open a book by Haruki Murakami or go through an incel's Twitter account and realize that there are men with skewed perceptions of women. I guess it's the same for women too. You know, Samantha even said it best. But that's not to say that there aren't any decent guys out there or that women will never find a loving man that treats women with respect, dignity, and agency. But it is scary that there are men out there who only see women as objects and vilify women every chance they get. And what makes things worse is that images and storylines of what the idol was supposed to be and how it was supposed to look like were leaked and they showed great promise. The original director, Amy Simons, finished 80% of the show only to be replaced by Sam Levinson because apparently the show is going too much in a female direction. The show is about the struggles of a young girl growing up in the male-dominated entertainment industry and how her childhood was taken from her and is now acting out. If Jocelyn ended up as the villain in the Simon's cut, I would honestly understand it. And these men think that disregarding all of that and showing cinematic scenes of women's bodies is what's going to sell, or that it's artistic. The Simets cut had scenes of Jocelyn with her girlfriends and she was supposed to have a sister. 
we could have seen the relationship of these girls and Jocelyn's girlhood suffering under the pressures of her fame, her youth snatched away from her before she could ever truly enjoy it. That seems like a pretty good villain origin story. Unfortunately, that version might not see the light of day. Thankfully, in the case of Murakami, if you like his work like I do, I suggest reading Banana Yoshimoto, Sayaka Murata's, and Meiko Kawakami's works. If you're into Bukowski, you might like Patricia Highsmith, but bottom line is there are talented women out there with beautiful, raw, and real portrayals of women, and we should support them. So, should men stop making media about women? Well, no. They've been doing it since time immemorial and they probably will continue to do so for a long time. Thankfully, there are male-led stories and other media that do women justice and treat the female characters as subjects rather than objects. I'm still in awe over the fact that Bo Burnham wrote and directed the film 8th Grade that depicts girlhood in the digital age so well. And I don't expect men to fully understand women. That is not the point of this essay. Rather, I want to point out the importance of women being able to tell our own stories and for us to be more intentional and intersectional with the media that we consume. There are things that even I can never truly understand or even fathom about the girlhood, the womanhood of women outside of my own country, outside of my own identity. That's why it's so important for us to consume media by women who are different from us. That's why women of different colors, queer women, trans women, disabled women, women who don't really fit the molds of the societies that they live in, should be able to tell their stories. And we should support them and let the industry know that we value the works of women, storytellers, and artists. It's also important to bear witness and become an audience to the art and literature women create because historically, Women's works have been stolen from under them by men. Camille Claudel and Margaret Keane, for instance. Hell, Amy Simons was not even the first victim of Sam Levinson, allegedly. Allegedly, Petra Collins was supposed to work in Levinson's Euphoria since he reached out to her because her photographs were used as quote-unquote inspiration for the show. And Petra Collins' art style emanates from, and even her muses appear on the show. And yet, she was told that they couldn't hire her and was shocked to see a billboard for Euphoria that looked eerily similar to her photographs. Her brand, which was developed as a means to make sense of and reclaim her girlhood, was just outright appropriated. So, in a world where women and girls are constantly repressed and underappreciated, we have to be proactive in seeking and consuming works by women for women.